everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this video, we have an amazing and insightful conversation between Joe Carlosare and Natalie Brunel, which we are sure you'll get a ton of value from. So are you a bull or a bear? I, I still can't tell. I don't know. Uh, I'm, <laughs> bullish on, I'm bullish on Bitcoin. I'm bullish on human beings to solve any problem that's in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, I am not a doom and gloomer. I'm extremely optimistic about the future. I think that we have incredible times ahead of us. I don't believe in this narrative that we're all gonna be you know, living in caves and the world's gonna collapse. I don't believe it um, for a variety of reasons because number one, I don't think it serves any purpose. And number two, I think human beings can solve any problem. Um, so, mm -hmm. so where I stand right now, I'm extremely positive on Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin has a very bright future. I don't pretend to know the, the path it's going to take. I'm not a believer in power law or these other models because it's too young of an asset and nobody can tell you where it's going to go from here. What I would say uh, with respect to a macro environment, I think things are going to get far crazier before any sort of significant deleveraging event that people are seem to be concerned about for the last several years. And, and I'll just say, full disclosure, I thought in 2020, three, we were going to get a recession, right? I thought the yeah. interest rate environment was going to be high enough to trigger a recession. I was wrong because what I miss, and I've said this publicly, what I misidentified was the massive amount of fiscal spending that is embedded into our economy whenever they raise rates. You got to remember all that extra, all those higher interest rates, that's someone's income. So if you're, again, if you're a boomer who's built up a huge nest egg and now you're getting effectively free subsidization from the government because you can stick it in a money market and get 5%, that's really, that's not that bad, right? They, they, they've had a great run, assets have done incredible, they can take some chips off the table, stick it in a money market account and see their assets grow at 5% backed by the United States government. So let's talk a little bit more about Bitcoin and how it's going to integrate into the legacy financial system. Some yeah. guests that I've had feel that there is ultimately going to be a limit. Like they don't believe that Bitcoin can hit 10 million USD per coin and others are on the flip side. And so I'm just kind of curious, how do you see it moving its way into being maybe more of a core macro asset? Because um, you said earlier that you do feel it will eat into bonds and, and real estate and 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 maybe not to the extent of you know, being 50% or more of the entire um, financial system, but, yeah. but how do you see it? So my, my case for Bitcoin is that nobody knows how big it can get still. I, I think it is incredibly small. I think what will primarily drive folks to Bitcoin um, is the issues I'm talking about with sovereign debt markets, right? There will be bigger players, and I don't, I don't mean necessarily nation states. I'm more actually focused on the private sector. Um, I think that there will be commercial banks abroad, um, mostly, that will recognize there are inherent risks with holding too much government debt. And they will look increasingly to diversify away from government debt to other assets. Maybe some of that is, in fact, gold. I think equities also will play a role in their diversification strategy. Um, and I also think Bitcoin plays a big role. And I'll explain why. So if you look at the the birth of the euro dollar system, which I know you've had guests a couple different times talk about. I think you've had Jeff Snyder on here. Is that right? He's, no, no. Oh, you haven't? Okay. Um, well, if you look at the birth of the euro dollar system, right? It grew as an actual decentralized system. It grew because a m bunch of dollars flooded into offshore markets. And then in the wake of World War II, uh, with many competitors destroyed, the U.S. being the strongest economy, the U.S. having a massive manufacturing base, a point of relative stability, friendly neighbors, uh, you know, a very strong military that would been built up. They decided this was the debt we want to hold to lend against. We want to have treasuries to be uh, to do outside the United States to be held by commercial banks. And we're going to issue dollar denominated obligations against those treasuries and against other assets. And we're confident in the long term geopolitical position of the United States, where, you know, as of today, I, you know, I think the biggest export the United States has to the world is dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that's been the current thing. Well, how does that relate to Bitcoin? Well, if the underpinning of that market, if the treasury market itself no longer is, uh, again, the trend is against that market, it is no longer in its uh, uh, heydays, right? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it is uh, on its way, in, it's in decline. Let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to look for some other neutral stable, some other neutral basis um, to hold up against its obligations. And 
although you need regulatory changes to have it qualify under Basel as a high quality liquid, liquid asset, you need some other regulatory changes to come in the way. I think banks would find that very attractive as a part of their portfolio. And that's where the money's at, right? Um, there's an old, uh, they asked a bank robber one time, like, what? Why did you rob the bank? And he said, because that's where the money's at, right? The money in our system is at those commercial banks, mm -hmm. which they create the majority of capital and credit in the world. Um, we live in a credit system. We don't live in really a fiat system. We live in credit because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, banks can create money out of thin air. Yeah. They don't actually have to have the underlying obligations. And this is really important for people to understand. People tend to look at the world and they see it from the standpoint of the Federal Reserve and the United States government controlling the dollar. But I, if I'm a foreign bank, Natalie, and I can print dollars, literally, I can issue dollar obligations without regard to anything in the Federal Reserve system. Right. How, how is the Fed at the center of the universe? That's the whole point of the euro dollar system. They can print money without actually having the money. They don't have to have the treasuries or the cash to say, now you have an obligation or now you have a liability. That's that's the key to understand. And the Fed does not oversee those foreign institutions. Now, they may backstop it through mm -hmm. swap lines and through yeah. other intervention foreign, but but they're, they're not in control. Mm -hmm. They're not the center of the financial universe, at least uh, globally. In this conversation between Joe Carlosar and Natalie Brunel, several key points and lessons emerged. Joe expressed a strong optimism about Bitcoin and humanity's ability to solve problems, rejecting the idea of an imminent economic collapse. He highlighted the unexpected resilience of the economy due to substantial fiscal spending, which postponed the anticipated recession. Joe emphasized that Bitcoin's future is uncertain but promising, particularly as a macro asset. He discussed how commercial banks, especially abroad, might diversify away from sovereign debt towards assets like Bitcoin, drawing parallels to the rise of the euro-dollar system. This system showed how foreign banks can create dollar obligations independently of the Federal Reserve, showcasing a decentralized financial landscape. The three main lessons from this conversation are 1. Significant fiscal spending has demonstrated the economy's unexpected resilience, delaying the anticipated recession. 2. Bitcoin holds substantial growth potential, especially as commercial banks seek to diversify away from sovereign debt. 3. The decentralized nature of the eurodollar system highlights how financial mechanisms can operate independently of central banks, suggesting a similar path for Bitcoin. So, what do you think about this Bitcoin discussion? Do you agree with Joe and his arguments? Let us know in the comments section below. If you enjoy this type of content and want to see more, make sure to give this video a like and subscribe to our channel. Until next time, keep learning and keep stacking.